Welcome to today's UCL Lunch Hour Lecture. I'm delighted uh, today that we've got a fascinating and very topical um, subject matter that will be delivered uh, by Professor Eric Brunner. Um, I hope you've been able to join the Slido chat stream to participate actively in the meeting. A link was emailed to everybody registered, so please do um, open that up because you can then submit questions at any point during um, the, the talk. Um, let me introduce myself. I'm Susan Mickey and I'm Professor of Health Psychology and Director of the Centre for Behaviour Change at UCL um, and both involved in aspects of climate change and uh, COVID-19 in research as well as um, in advising the government. I'm delighted that we have Professor Eric Brunner with us. Is, uh, Professor Eric Brunner is a social epidemiologist, co-director of the Whitehall 2 study of health inequalities and ageing, and a visiting professor at Osaka University. He is supported by the British Health Heart Foundation. And as I said, Eric's lecture is extremely topical. It considers social transformation, health, climate change, and social inequality as we start to emerge from the COVID-19 pandemic. Well, I hope it's starting to emerge from the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. The main focus of evidence that Eric presents today is on the widespread assumption that our well-being and health is tightly coupled to economic growth. So thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Susan, for your very good introduction and for chairing this session. Um, my name is uh, Eric Brunner, as Susan has said. Um, I'm an epidemiologist interested in um, inequality and looking at um, health trends into the future after the epidemic. And thanks very much. I hope you participate actively in, in the lecture. Your comments and questions on Slido would be most welcome. My title is The Planet, Economic Growth and Ourselves Post-Pandemic. And the focus is very much on looking at health trends in rich countries, and in particular in Japan, where I've had the privilege of uh, working for the last 10 years. COVID-19 reminds us of our deep vulnerability to environmental threats. And this lecture reflects on the, on the pandemic in relation to some of the global challenges, inequalities in health and well-being, economic growth, climate change, and the links between these. We are living through a time of severe disruption. Will we be able to seize the moment to save the planet as well as ourselves? So looking at some of the dimensions of inequality that the pandemic has very much brought into the news, into our minds. Um, first of all, when we um, look at um, the question of who is going to lose their jobs, we can see that some early modelling by the Institute for Fiscal Studies shows that it is the young, those under 25, um, who, who are um, most unfairly affected. And you can see this is particularly true for the younger women, where something like 35% are expected to be um, uh, furloughed or were expected to be furloughed and indeed this is probably those women and men who are going to be most likely to lose their jobs and therefore to face um, a grim prospect a grim future of uncertainty as we come out of the pandemic when we look at that in terms of the current earnings of individuals, we can see this again, a very, very strong relationship where the people who are most likely to be in a shutdown sector are those in the lowest three um, deciles, those three tenths of income. So it's those who are on low incomes who are people who are suffering, not the people at the top, where less than 10% are expected to be shut down sectors of the economy. 
If we look at the death rates themselves according to material circumstances, here we can see the age standardized death rates by decile of area deprivation. And these are the data from the Office of National Statistics in March and April 2020. And um, Mick Dadasaria from the LSE has um, produced um, this very clear graph, which shows that, you know, as with all deaths, um, there is a strong relationship to the, to the worse deprivation associated with considerably higher death rates. But with COVID-19, there is a much stronger relationship. So those in the bottom 30% um, of areas in the country, according to the index of multiple deprivation, those are the people where, um, where death is most likely to strike. And it's well known to the ethnicity is a very important factor. And MCDAD um, has summarized, again, the data for deaths from March and April. And these forest plots are comparing the likelihood of death um, against the reference group and showing that um, those with a black Bangladeshi, Pakistani, or Indian background of those in the very high risk group, something like three to four times more likely to die of COVID than those of white ethnicity. And this is age adjusted data. And when the data are multiply adjusted, taking into account um, area, occupation, household composition, and some health measures, um, these excess risks still remain. And we don't really understand um, why that excess risk exists. There may be biological and probably cultural components. The lockdown highlights the environmental gains we could make. The bird song, the clean air, the quiet streets, the CO2 output, which has plummeted during the time um, of the extreme lockdown, which has now sadly come up again. The point is that this moment of disruption is one where we can perhaps find ways to decarbonize um, our economy. We've already heard a lot about um, uh, the air industry, airports and so on, oil, etc. We decarbonize our economy or we see a future which is pretty grim. Desertification on a wide scale, resource wars, wars on um, the grounds of water supply, food, and so on, mass human migration, some models suggesting that as many as 3 billion people will, will be displaced because their traditional locations have become um, uninhabitable. Ice sheets melting, and as a result, sea level rising, many cities, including London, submerged beneath the rising waves. So COVID is a, is a shocking and disruptive force, but behind it, um, it seems to me, and I'm sure many of you will share this view, that climate change is something which um, governments have not tackled sufficiently urgently and now is a moment when we can take stock again and think about the issue of growth and there's no doubt that there will be an economic resurgence because the lockdown was a very artificial way of, bring, of depressing the economy the question is what in the medium to long term will be the nature of that economic resurgence will it be business as usual will it be green growth 
where the need for green technology stimulates economies? Or will it be more radically degrowth, as some um, economists um, highlighted in one of Tim Harford's recent articles um, suggested, where it's seen that the capacity of the planet to sustain the kinds of lifestyles that we share are really not sustainable. And um, the idea of degrowth really is to say we need to reset the kind of economic activity that we have so that the Earth's capacity, as shown in the graph at the bottom, is not exceeded by our reliance on um, fossil fuels on the production of carbon dioxide. And the key point about degrowth is that it is not um, a hair shirt uh, philosophy. It's a philosophy that says we need to reframe the idea of prosperity, the idea of well-being. The difficulty, if we go back um, into the post-Second World War period, is that there has been a very sustained ideology which links together economics, well-being and health. And it was keen to um, articulate this in the idea of animal spirits, our innate urge to activity which makes the wheels of life go round, our rational selves choosing between the alternatives as best we are able calculating where we can, but often falling back for our motive on whim or sentiment or chance. What he was saying was that psychology, our spirit, is very linked to, um, to economic growth and vice versa, that when there's economic growth, um, very often um, the spirits both individually and collectively, at social level, are lifted. This then suggests that it may be really rather difficult to contemplate um, a life without economic growth as a way of life that will um, promote, us, promote the health of us all. So this post-growth, post-pandemic question can be put um, in, in the following ways. How tight is the link between economic growth, human health, and well-being? In other words, can we have our planet and our health? Can we ditch the orthodoxy that our well-being depends on economic growth? So one of the best populations to look at this question is Japan. There's a natural experiment that went on between 1992 and 2013 when the Japanese economy went through a period of long economic stagnation. And the question is, did that lead to poorer health and greater health inequality? And we can see just how dramatic those two periods of economic activity in Japan have been. From 1949 until 1992, you can see the exponential growth in the Nikkei Stock Exchange Index. After that, the index went back down to the level that it was around 1980. In terms of um, uh, economic growth, we can see on the left that around the 1960s and 70s, that growth in Japan sometimes exceeded 10% per year, the kind of level that we're seeing in China at the moment, much higher than um, in the UK and the USA. But since then, there's been a downward trend and in the study period that we're thinking of, which is highlighted in grey between 92 and 2013, you can see that the average annual growth in Japan 
was 0.9% compared to over 2% in the UK and the USA. So here we have um, this natural experiment, which allows us to look at the impact of this stagnant period on health and health inequality in Japan. And um, uh, this, is, this is the data that I'm going to show you now. So first of all, we will take a look at the all-cause mortality rate trends. This is the hardest, most reliable, and least biased data. Um, we're looking here at a graph showing the trends in mortality between 1979 and 2016. And it's age standardized, which means that we can compare both the countries and we can compare the rates across time as these societies age. And you can see for Japan that, first of all, Japan has got this, um, has got the lowest all cause mortality rate. And that corresponds, of course, to its very high life expectancy. But when we compare the period before 1992, we can see that with the, with the period afterwards, the trend continues. There is no slowing down of the downward trend in the Japanese all-cause mortality rate. This is interesting particularly because it extends right up to 2016, whereas we can see that for the USA and for the UK, that the, um, uh, the mortality rate trend after 2010 started to flatten out. And this is um, the effect that Angus Deaton and Anne Case have called the deaths of despair. These are the people left behind in the USA and the UK who use um, um, drugs and abuse other substances, who commit suicide, and, and so on. And that is not um, a necessary feature of depression, of economic depression, as Japan um, and indeed France demonstrates. And we can see there with South Korea that they are steaming away. Their mortality rate is going down even faster than those other countries. When we look at the public health um, important um, causes of death, um, ischemic heart disease, heart attacks or coronary disease, top left, cancer and stroke, we can see similarly that the mortality rates in Japan go down very nicely over most of the period of um, the um, slow economic growth between 92 and 2013. And uh, the increase in ischemic heart disease in Japan there is almost certainly a technical um, coding of cause of de death issue. Um, Japan doesn't do quite so well on the stroke front, but nevertheless, we can see that the trends are continuing very nicely downwards, whereas for heart disease and for stroke, the top left and bottom right, that there are signs in the USA and the UK of a flattening out. So the narrative in the Anglo-Saxon economies is very much persisting the idea that economics um, and health are inextricably linked up. Even in terms of suicide, we can see for Japan the, the, the heavier black line that when the low growth period started, there was an increase in suicide. And this is a very famous phenomenon in Japan um, that is not really the topic of our uh, conversation here, but we could talk about later. But what's interesting is that through public health measures that the Japanese managed to stop that suicide rate. And you can see indeed that um, from about 2008 onwards, that the suicide rates actually declined in both men and women in Japan. 
whereas in the USA and the UK, again, those rates went in the opposite direction over the last 10 years. So leaving, leaving the hard um, death data behind, we can now look at um, some really interesting data from a nationally representative survey which um, used the same um, stratified sampling design for 10 ways of data collection in almost three quarters of a million people between 1986 and 2013 to examine the trend in inequality in well-being according to income over the period of economic stagnation. And this is a, a study we're working on uh, right now. And what it does is to really get close to uh, the Keynesian idea of animal spirits. What we might expect is that well-being overall would decline, and that perhaps um, that inequality in well-being according to income would tend to increase um, if Japan was following uh, the Anglo-Saxon economic model. The, the, the context of this study is the pattern of income inequality in Japan um, before and after the study period. And here we can see that the Japanese managed to keep their income inequality before and after tax down to the level it was during the period of economic growth. The Gini coefficient is above that in Scandinavia, but below that in the UK and the USA. So here we look at the results for the trends in overall good and poor health in the population divided into four age groups. Children and teenagers top left, working age adults top right, younger and older old um, in the uh, two panels at the bottom. And the focus, um, I think, uh, today should be on working age adults where the economy would have a more direct effect on people's health. And what we can see is that at the beginning of the slowdown period, that the proportion with good health did fall slightly below 60% in men in blue and women in orange. But um, that decline in the proportion of the population believing themselves to be in good health, in other words, to, to be experiencing um, buoyant animal spirits, um, does not really go down substantially. And uh, in relation to poor health at the other end of the spectrum, we can see that during that long course over 20 years of the, of the uh, economic slowdown period, that poor health um, prevalence really didn't go up at all. We're now looking at rather complicated graphs which uh, summarise the level of well-being inequality, which is to say the difference in the proportions um, across the distribution of well-being. And focusing again on um, the top right curved graph of the working age adults, we can see uh, at the beginning of the period, that those at the bottom of the income distribution were more likely, um, um, sorry, were less likely to report um, good self-rated health to the, in, in around 10%. That's a difference, but it's not very large. And over the course of the economic slowdown, you can see... Um, that there was a shrinking of the inequality going towards zero and then a slight expansion. But the changes are really not very great at all. So here is some data that does really directly address the question of whether the economic stagnation in Japan 
led to poorer health and health inequality. And my summary is pretty optimistic. During the 20 years of the economic stagnation, income inequality was modest and stable. Headline health statistics continued to improve. That's the mortality rates. And overall, levels of well-being remained similar to those during the miracle growth period before 1992. In terms of inequality in well-being, um, according to income, um, inequality was, in fact, broadly stable. So then you may ask, well, how these are all very good statistics. How did Japan manage its COVID-19 epidemic? Well, we can look just at a couple of the major findings. And here we see um, the rate per million, not age adjusted, um, but very, very clear findings. Japan and South Korea in the green blue colors, um, the rate in the 80 or so days after the epidemic began, um, that's up, correct up to May the 19th, is six per million. The rate in Europe, or the rates in Europe and the United States were 500 per million. You think these um, figures are a strong contrast when we look at the actual number of deaths uh, rather than the rates on a linear scale what we can see is really stark indeed. Japan and South Korea are down at the bottom. On May the 19th, there had been an estimated confirmed de death count of 771, compared to approaching 40,000 in the UK and 90,000 in the United States. What can we make of this? Well, it, there are probably multiple explanations, but one is that people in Japan are more healthy. Smaller inequalities, fantastic health, high life expectancy, and apparent um, resilience in the face of the coronavirus, both at the social and at the biological level. So we finish with a post-pandemic question. How tight is the link between economic growth, human health and well-being? It is not tight. It does not need to be um, deterministic. Can we have our planet and, and our health? Yes. But how do we get from here to there in the pan post pandemic situation? Can we ditch the orthodoxy that our well being depends on economic growth? Difficult, but yes, we must. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was a fascinating and very important lecture because it really goes to the heart of what we need to think about and address uh, going forward. Can I remind everybody uh, that we're taking questions via Slido? Uh, so you should have the link uh, to that with the information you received uh, on this lecture and just type away and I will be able to see them and um, read them out uh, for Professor Brunner to answer. So um, great, we have them coming in already. Um, so, uh, Catherine Simons says, Japan will have benefited from improvements, particularly in cardio treatments, independently of its own economic status. How much is this factored in? Um, well, um, I think what lies behind that question from Catherine is uh, the idea that the healthcare system um, <clears throat> is, the, is the crucial um, issue and Japan does have a socialized healthcare system, um, which means that access is good for all, and that no doubt makes a contribution. Um, but I think we have to look 
um, as public health people put it, more upstream at the way um, the society and the culture is organized. And one of the, one of the aspects of uh, Japanese culture is, is a kind of East Asian um, idea that um, people work collectively together to achieve uh, common goals. And um, in the, in the post-war situation, that was um, very much the case, that um, uh, everyone worked very, very hard um, to build a society um, which would allow the, allow the country to escape from the horrors um, of um, the Japanese imperial period and the, the defeat of the Second World War. So I think I think it's the, I think we need to look at the um, psychosocial dimension of Japan to really understand its success. Th thank you. And a, a follow up question from me on that. Do you think? That, that kind of uh, collectivism is also associated with um, more of a propensity to follow rules than, for example, in the United States or in the UK? Yeah, yes, I do. And, and it, it's very clear that there is still um, in Japan a kind of what we would regard as an outdated respect for um, authority. And, um, you know, there's a seniority, an age based seniority system. And that, of course, has its downside, and it also means that um, individualism um, uh, is somewhat less, and probably the, the creativity um, is correspondingly reduced. But I think what's what's interesting is that there's quite often a, a tendency to um, suggest that there's a huge difference between Asian culture and European culture. And yet, when we look at the last 10 weeks, what we can see is that, um, that Europeans are pretty good um, at obeying rules when they can see that it's in their interest. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And we, we definitely have, have seen that. And long may it last, given the situation we're in at the moment. Now, we have a, a big picture question here from Jill. How can the benefits of a low economic growth, sorry, low sustainable economic growth and well-being, health, bi biodiversity be shown to people in a truly persuasive way. And she follows up with carrots versus sticks. Yes, well, th th I guess that is the um, uh, $64 trillion question, the 7.5 billion people question. Um, you know, my my lecture has been somewhat fanciful in suggesting that um, <clears throat> you know this this political, economic, and epidemiological moment in human history is one where you know where everything's going to suddenly um, snap into place and we're all going to uh, behave in a in a in a way which recognises the uh, responsibility that we have towards ourselves collectively um, and, and, and uh, to, to indeed to the planet. Um, uh, I, wish, I wish it were going to come to pass. But the fact is that, um, you know, something like 25% of the world's population, basically the members of OECD countries, are living in general that uh, aren't sustainable lifestyle in terms of consumption of energy and resources <clears throat> and um, uh, we you know we cannot we cannot distribute that standard of living to 7.5 billion people the population of the earth therefore we are going either to have to change radically the way we think about economics um, or we are heading for climate disaster. My lecture is a very small contribution in that what I'm trying to say is that we can have good health and we can have, if you like, high animal spirits um, without the need to be endlessly consuming, shopping, burning fossil fuel and so on. So, uh, um, Anjali here, um, 
has a question that really follows up from uh, your answer, which is how can we change the mindset that well-being depends on economic growth as the belief is in developed countries? Um, and I think the point there is that um, the narrative in so many countries is about GDP as the objective, and that's what we're all striving for. And so it's quite a shift of mindset uh, for people to realize that actually uh, well-being doesn't depend on economic growth. So this is actually how you would use your data and your observations uh, to try and change things. Yes. Well, I, I think that is a, a, a brilliant question. And I think that one of the key um, actions that needs to take place is for um, the economic consequences of the pandemic to be shouldered by um, the wealthier people, the people with, uh, you know, people who are doing very well at the moment, and by the corporations. And that, to me, is the, um, the, the, the key step, that there has to be a, a, a real, we have, to, we have to walk the talk. In, in terms of our collective uh, political behavior. And I think that is, fun, that's a fundamental, that's the sine qua non, that is what needs to happen. And if it doesn't happen, then no one is gonna believe um, that real change is taking place. Thank it's you. a big bullet, it's a big bullet to bite. Yeah. Yeah, and we could have a whole session on that, that very one question, I think. And um, here's a slightly different question. In the post-pandemic world, which area or areas of research would you recommend as having high priority? In what studies would you invest? Big question. Uh, yes, a, a big question. Um, uh, can, I, can I come back to you on that one? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I think... I think I think you know that there there are some obvious issues like um, alternative energy production. Um, uh, you know what 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 are the fundamentals um, of our society that we've come to recognise in the last few weeks? Um, you know things like education, care, social care, health care. Um, we have to we have to focus on what matters instead of focusing on um you know a kind of consumerist um shall a shallow consumerist ethic yeah and and this next question i'm not sure if this is referring to short term in terms of the pandemic or long term forever given that actually as the environment is slowly being destroyed, the chance of pandemics are getting um, increasingly higher. The question is, if the link between economic growth and well-being is so loose, would you support further sustained economic and lifestyle restrictions to keep infection rates low? I, I think we need a, a mixture of, of measures. Um, but what we, I think what we've learned um, amongst other things, is that um, the most basic public health um, contact tracing system um, is, is something that's absolutely crucial and something um, that unfortunately has been lacking um, in, in the UK. So, you know, I think we do need, we, we need all kinds of measures, um, but, um, um, uh, you know, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not sure that this is the crucial long-term dynamic. The one that, that this relationship between um, economic growth and and the pan and the pandemic, uh, because um, rich countries have handled this uh, situation in 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 very diverse ways. Yeah, and. And this is a question now bringing in um, third world countries. Uh, Japan was or is an economic powerhouse. How does economic growth, human health and social well-being 
how they compared with third world countries, the result might be the opposite. Yes, I, I, um, I think this is a very broad question which raises a, a host of issues, but a crucial point is yes, uh, Japan um, what was and in many ways continues to be an economic powerhouse and it's because they've got a high standard of living uh, that perhaps they've been able to um, have such amazing headline health statistics. Um, we can see what we saw in those graphs that um, the decline in the mortality rate in South Korea um, was even faster than, than that in Japan and, and of course in South Korea they they had a massive economic growth period whilst um, while Japan was stagnating. And we do not know what would have happened in Japan if Japan had continued to grow in the way that it had done um, in the second part of the 20th century. Um, so I'm, not, I'm certainly not advocating um, that um, growth has to stop in sub-Saharan Africa, in China, in India, um, what, what I'm advocating is that we need to reset our thinking about um, the kind of economy that we have in the already rich countries. And there are two ways of looking at that. Either we can say, okay, well, we, we stop now and we um, redistribute the wealth um, a bit within our within our countries, or we start to go back to a to, to an international perspective, a new kind of global perspective, where we think that actually um, what would benefit all of us is if there was less inequality between countries. Yeah, and and um, you know I can't I can't answer all the questions, um, but I think that. That's um, that's something which, you know, um, the level of absolute poverty in the world has gone down dramatically in the last fifty years. Um, people like Hans Rosling have made it, you know, made it very clear that we, you know, it's not all gloom and doom, but redistribution will help. Um, for example, the sub-Saharan Africa would um, speed up the reduction in the birth rate and might um, help us on our road towards um, sustainable living. I mean, from a, from, a, from a fossil fuel point of view. Yeah, thank you. And we've got time for uh, one more question, um, which is surely the fact that poorer people are more likely to die from COVID contradicts your argument that economic growth and well-being are not linked. Uh, that's that's uh, a, very, a very good point. And um, I'm glad you raised that because I think what we have to recognise is that it is not just about being poor, it's about the inequality um, in our society <laughs> that, 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 is, that, that is the problem. Because we're talking about unequal access to resources, including health information, health care, uh, 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 decent care homes, and so on and so forth. So those, those people at the bottom of the income distribution, they are, in a sense, being victimized by the way we organize our society. And um, when, when we're inside that society, it's rather difficult to <clears throat> contemplate that things could be different. And the, the, the example of Japan um, shows you, I mean, Japan has inequality. Japan has um, some red marks on the sustainable development goals. Um, Japan is not a perfect society, but the death rate in Japan out of a population of 126 million is estimated at present to be 851. Yeah, yeah, incredibly impressive. Um, so I think, you know, really what you've been demonstrating throughout is that it's not the level of economic uh, development that is key necessarily to health and well-being, um, but the inequalities uh, within countries 
are absolutely key. And it does raise the issue about um, how do we tackle that question? I mean, we all know in the UK, we live in an extremely unequal society. Sadly, the pandemic has um, created more inequality uh, in terms of those who are already on low incomes with uh, precarious um, incomes uh, suffering the most financially, millions of people falling between uh, stools in terms of being protected financially, and also those in the most, uh, the poorest, most overcrowded housing without outside space, uh, suffering much more from the um, lockdown restrictions. And um, what's going to be key going forwards is um, as we unlock, as we um, ease these restrictions, how are we going to move forward um, for the best of whole, the whole of society, which does mean uh, taking the, op, you know, the, the opportunities that we have um, to really tackle inequalities, which, Eric, as you said right at the beginning, is part of why we're such a fragile society, why we haven't handled the pandemic as well as other countries. And we really need to learn these lessons um, and um, not only reduce inequality, but as you say, ensure that we really prioritize um, our planet and human well-being uh, rather than uh, the uh, some of the cruder economic indicators of what some people might uh, think of as success. And I think um, from the questions um, you had, Eric, you can see that this was a very engaged audience um, and you've got people thinking and um, you shared a lot of uh, very interesting work. So um, thank you very much. Uh, for that and thank you everybody for joining us and I do hope you take away the messages into your everyday life and do what you can to uh, put academic reflections into practice um, and I want to just um, remind you that you'll receive an email in the next day or so with a short feedback survey uh, please use it and you'll also get the, um, the schedule for um, upcoming lectures so Eric thank you again on behalf of uh, myself and the audience who I haven't had the pleasure to actually see, but I know you're out there and uh, keep safe everyone. Bye.